It is noon on Thursdays, folks. Ted Ralston here in downtown Honolulu in the Think Tech Hawaii studios overlooking something in the background. Looks like some structural materials that we left behind from the studio reconstruction. Anyway, we have on our show where the drone leads, where we talk about topics associated with the emerging technology and business of drones. We have with us again, uh, second time flyer on this show, but the first time by Skype, we have Gretchen West of Hogan Lovells in uh, Silicon Valley with us. Silicon Valley in the world, I guess I should say, because your company is a global international company. So hey, welcome yes, thank back, you for Gretchen. having me. It's good to be okay. back. And we, we have you by Skype. Next time we'll have to, we'll have to alternate this uh, in-person Skype, in-person Skype, and, and uh, work it that way. So anyway, uh, Gretchen has a long history in coming up with the policies and the protocols and the methods that we're going to be using collectively to advance uh, this business of uh, drones and unmanned air systems. And uh, Hogan Levels has taken a lead in that as well. Can you tell us up an update since last year when you were here about what Hogan's doing and what you're doing in terms of the CDA and activities such as that? Sure, so I'll start with Hogan Levels. We are a global law firm and we have a thriving drone practice where we're working with a variety of companies from small to large on helping them with understanding the, the drone market and the environment. There's, as we all know, Part 107 came into effect uh, August of last year, and so we've been working with lots of clients to get them waivers for some of the expanded operations. We've been working with clients on the policy side, helping them uh, with some lobbying efforts and shaping policy, and also working with some smaller companies to help them understand the market potential and, and find funding uh, for a lot of the startups. From a commercial drone alliance perspective, that's a, an industry-led nonprofit association. We formed that really because we felt that commercial end users were underrepresented in the conversation. And they really are the most important because they're the customer for all the manufacturers and service providers. And we found that they were skeptical about adopting drone technology, uh, prim primarily due to the regulatory environment, but also you know, a lot of these industries, these big industries, oil and gas, construction, mining, uh, inspection, agriculture, and on and on, yeah, they're, they're fairly risk averse. And so because of the regulatory environment, because of privacy issues, because of state and local regulatory issues, um, they're just, because of safety and reliability issues, they're just concerned a little bit with implementing drones on a, on a widespread basis. And so really the mission of the Commercial Drone Alliance is to work to reduce those barriers and help educate them about the benefits of technology so that they can adopt drone technology and move this industry forward. That's great. Does that also give the, these groups that might be potential end users or intermediate users uh, providing some product for a customer of their own, does it give them an opportunity to uh, ex express the, the fact that they don't understand what's going on and get educated, part one, and part two, come forth with requirements that are really important in their domain and then have the manufacturers hear that? and. I'm just thinking of the situation out here in Hawaii. We have a lot of, of course, salt air situations. So we have a, if you look at the drone repair shops out here, UAS repair shops, they're basically taking care of salt corrosion on the circuit boards. So we have uh, that sort of situation. We have high winds. We have a lot of GPS out areas, night areas because of the topography and stuff. So would a company out here have a voice to the manufacturer through the CDA? Well, that's one of the goals that we're trying to accomplish. And we've really only been, uh, we, we launched about a year ago. And we've been really busy on the, the policy side over the last year, uh, dealing with a lot of the things that are happening in the United States on Capitol Hill. But the other kind of, the other mission we have is this education side. And so we've been going out to lots of different events and in different industries and just educating about the benefits of drones, talking about what Part 107 means, talking about what is legal and what is not and what opportunities are there. And so from that perspective, we're educating the end users, but you're absolutely right. It also, we need to bring the end users into the mix as well. And we have several that are part, that are members of our organization because they, like you said, they need to help educate the manufacturers and service providers of what they need. It's different from location to location, from industry to industry. And so, you know, instead of a manufacturer creating a drone that they think could service any industry, it's good to know what those end users need. And so we're, we are trying to do some of that kind of matchmaking as well. That's great. And uh, I think we're attempting to join your, your uh, operation to the CDA as the very first academic member in that, in that group. And of course, uh, education and academia kind of go hand in hand. That's our role here. 
we, at the University of Hawaii, we have also all the community colleges on all the islands linked in with the main university, so it's like one system. So we have a, a great access to public at the front. We have great research functionality in the core, and it's a nice setup for both the promotion of the information about drones and also doing experiments and doing uh, scenarios and such with uh, law enforcement and public safety people to pull in what their requirements are. And you know, you, we all deal with what's been provided to us by the manufacturers and we have to uh, be ready for surprises when the, when the end users tell us what they really want. And I'm sure you've seen some of that in initial interactions with your users against what the manufacturers have thought. Yeah, and I think we've seen that for years, even before we formed the Commercial Drone Alliance. I've been in this industry about 13 years, I think, and there, there was always kind of this gap between what was being developed and what the end user needed, whether that was military, law enforcement, civil, or commercial use. And I think that gap is shrinking, um, but there's a lot of technology that's still being developed and there, that you know, we need to bring together the end user community better with the people that are making those different types of technologies to make sure that you know, we're streamlined across the board. We're going to be taking a, a first crack at that here in Hawaii in, in about three weeks. We have our, our the, kind of the top of the public safety domain is really the Department of Homeland Security's funded uh, state fusion centers in various states. And through that group, we sort of have uh, fingers to all the areas where there's uh, activity in public safety and law enforcement. So we'll be starting some of that scenario-based interaction uh, very soon here. And again, it'll be kind of a little, little steps at a time, I think, to get to the point where we finally have some kind of a specification that would be useful. But uh, I agree with you. It's, it's been a, a, quite an interesting transition. Uh, over. The, if you've been 13 years in this, you've seen four generations of, of <laughs> rollover happen in this game. And just imagine what the rollover is going to happen in the future. Battery power density. Uh, reduction in size of some of the critical sensors like ADS-B and uh, radars and such, uh, onboard processing to kind of get the man out of the loop and let the drone take care of its own mission. Uh, so what, in your own mind, Gretchen, what do you see as how this technology future is going to evolve in terms of the functionality available uh, to the user? Well, I think the, you know, the end state for anyone that's in this market is, is really kind of looking at autonomy. It's not going to be flying a drone by remote control, standing on the ground, watching it, making sure it's within your visual line of sight. The idea, because drones are, are meant to create efficiencies, the idea is to reach towards autonomy. And so as technologies are being developed, I think we're getting closer to that. And then, you know, the regulatory environment needs to catch up to that. But, you know, an example I like to use is, you know, a farmer right now can use a drone and even they can program it autonomously to fly now, but based on the regulations, they, they have to, you know, be part of the operation and have their eyes on the drone while it's surveying their field. In the future, what we want to see happen in this industry is, is there's no interaction between the farmer and the drone. The drone goes out and, and pre-programmed routes at, at different selected times and it, and it completes its mission. And all the farmer has to do is open up his computer and get the data and get the answers to whatever the questions are. And so really it's, it's, it, you know, it's about autonomy and it's about creating valuable, actionable information for the end user. And that's part of the requirements structure that we need to be looking at because you know the requirements around you know what a farmer needs versus what a construction company needs from a data perspective could be very different and I think for these end users it's it, at the end of the day it's not going to be about the drone it's going to be about the information that they collect that's useful and it's and it's and it's timely and actionable and so I think that's the future of where we're going and in the meantime, you know, a lot of technology needs to be developed to make these systems safe. You mentioned ADS-B, you know, miniaturized ADS-B because there are issues with being able to identify drones that are in the airspace now. Um, you know, technology that can make them safe and reliable to be able to take over if, if, you know, what if a propeller fails or something like that. So, you know, those technologies are being developed now, but I think it, it all kind of the end goal is, is reaching towards autonomy. You know, it's interesting, and uh, last year when you were talking out here addressing the uh, U.S. District Court, the main themes were going to be the end state functional software that pulls the information together and generates some kind of an expressed uh, set of information to a decision maker. That probably hasn't changed. The autonomy that is behind that now is interesting to see you're speaking about that sneaking up. I think you were speaking of training. 
and uh, countermeasures or control of drones as being the three major legs under that three-legged stool. Is that still pretty much how you see it today? I think it is. I mean, I think it's still, you know, it's still about the data and it's still about the information that the end user wants and needs. It's about the safety of the system, which can, which includes command and control. It includes sense and avoid technology. It includes, you know, the, all of those kinds of things. Um, you know, but some newer topics and newer areas of interest are kind of this counter drone technology. So while everyone's excited about drones and using drones, there are others that, that you know, want to figure out how do we keep rogue drones out of our operations? How do we keep people that are you know, using their drone to maybe look at uh, our facility. How do we keep some of those drones out? You know, a good example is, is, a, is a sports stadium. They want to use drones to, to film practices. They want to use drones personally for their own business. At the same time, you know, during a, a sporting event, they don't want rogue drones flying over a stadium. And so how do you, you know, there's a lot of interest in using drones by these end users, but there's also interest in keeping out uh, unauthorized or rogue drones. And so this counter counter UAS counter drone technology is a is a new big kind of trend, and I think it's become a very important one. That's exactly right. And in fact, I was uh, addressing our Department of Health here a couple of weeks ago, as we do periodically on updating them, and uh, they came up with an example that I hadn't thought of. But we've already had one case out here where a a rogue situation applied. Uh, it was a a, a licensed and properly certified uh, operator was using a drone to measure damage on the reef after a recent ship grounding. You have to understand what damage you've done to the reef and find some way to fix it. So the ship is being moved and the, observing it. Another operator who was uh, perhaps not even certified, we don't know, was in there following with his drone, the first guy, to maybe undercut him in terms of the business side of providing information to the uh, the shipping company. So right away, we see even in a simple situation like that, they need to know, hey, my drone's up there, I know what I'm doing, what's this other guy doing? If he knows what I'm doing, he's likely copying or attempting to uh, take advantage of what I'm up to. So absolutely right, even on a one-on-one -on -one basis, not just a terrorist situation or something like that, but plain old business, we have to understand what's going on and make sure we, those who are properly authorized to perform are are allowed to do that without being interfered with. Yeah, and that kind of comes down to accountability. I mean, the, the, you know, everybody knows that there was a drone registration process where people had to register their drones, and it was a yeah. fairly easy process to go through and, and you know, cost about $5. And that was recently revoked by um, the courts in the United States. And so now nobody has, no, no hobbyist or recreational user has to register their drones. And so there's now a lack of accountability. And that's not to say that that community is the one that's, that, you know, they're flying unauthorized or in, in, in rogue ways, but, but there needs to be some accountability so that commercial operations can, can continue and businesses can thrive at the same time as recreational users can still enjoy the, kind of the freedom of flight in, in flying what, what were considered model aircraft. That, that's a really cool word, accountability. It applies in so many aspects here. Let's pick that up after our break and talk about it in a bit more detail. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to YouTube, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Alelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha, my name is Raya Salter, and I'm the host of Power Up Hawaii, which you can see live from 1 to 1.30 every Tuesday at thinktechhawaii.com and then later on YouTube. I am an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. And on Power Up Hawaii, we come together to talk about how can Hawaii walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. To do that, we talk to stakeholders all over the spectrum, from clean energy technology folks to community groups to politicians to regulators to the utility. So please join us Tuesdays at 1 o'clock for Power Up Hawaii. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii. We're back here, folks, at Ralston, uh, Think Tech Studios, downtown Honolulu, our show Where the Drone Leads, with our guest standing by in Silicon Valley, once again, Gretchen West. Welcome back to our show, Gretchen. Thank you for having me. Good to be back. By Skype, absolutely. It's good to be back and uh, good to have you here. And uh, 
it's really neat that we have these people all over the country who are willing to spend their time, get on Skype, and hook up with us because we are kind of isolated from a lot of uh, bus traffic and such out here. And uh, keeping in touch with people uh, is, is really important for us. And there's a lot of activity taking place, certainly in Silicon Valley where you are. What a great place to be. And on the other end of the country, you got D.C. In fact, you must spend all your time back and forth between D.C. and, and Silicon Valley. I do. <laughs> yeah. And so when we were talking before about accountability before the break, this issue of accountability and proper use and avoiding misuse and malicious uh, use of drones implies there's some framework of education or information that people can collect and can understand what accountability means in that regard. We all know that that's not here yet. We have information all over the place, like so much of it, but it, it's hard to really put your finger on what truly matters. In fact, we're having that very discussion online right now with uh, regard to 107 versus uh, public aircraft ops for civil use. What's the better approach? Even in that fairly controlled uh, discussion, there is no one place you can turn to for the salient information that allows you to make a decision. So just imagine the guy who uses his drone for wedding photography or fish finding or something like that, that where does he turn? What, what do you see in, uh, in your operation when, when that question comes up? how to get people information about what the limits are. Yeah, and that's, and that's a tough one. And it just, it's education, education, education. And it's really hard to reach the masses. You know, there's some programs out there like Know Before You Fly. Uh, the FAA has got a lot of information on their website. But, you know, it's hard to require somebody to go to a website and look for information. A lot of manufacturers are putting flyers in the packaging of the drone, but not all of them are. And so, you know, there's not a good answer. And I know those, those questions are, you know, those discussions are happening all the time. Just in D.C. last week, we had a conversation around this. How do we educate some of the, the new users? Because, you know, for a lot of us that have been in this industry a long time, you know, that, that worked in unmanned technologies in the military or for law enforcement or as a recreational modeler, uh, had some awareness that these were aircraft and there are rules of the sky. Now you can go to Best Buy or order a drone online at Amazon.com and, and you know you could be a real estate agent or a wedding photographer and, and just don't have the awareness that these are aircraft or that they're flying in the sky. And we all know nobody reads every single word that's in an instruction manual. And so you toss the flyers aside and you don't pay attention. So how do we reach those people? And it's not necessarily necessarily their fault. They're just, you know, there is not an awareness that there are these are aircraft and there are rules of the sky that they that people need to follow and you know we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people and some of the predictions are getting up into the, into the millions and so you know it's just a matter of constant education and working together across this industry everyone needs to be spreading this message not just a group like the commercial drone alliance or the other nonprofits it really needs to be everybody exactly right that's kind of how we see it out here and it, again in education which is what we do at the university it's that's something we should be paying attention to and i think uh We've heard so many times that need, and we have it really in, in spades at the time of the legislative sessions, because our legislators, they need information that they can make good decisions based on, and our experience last year wasn't good in that regard, and so we're taking action now in July to get ready for December, and uh, trying to come up with events, interactions, printed material, whatever form makes sense, that tries to consolidate things down to a reasonable range of things you have to know about in order to make a uh, educated decision. I think at the end of our legislative session last year, the last bills that went through, the legislative groups that were looking at them simply said, we don't have the right background of information in order to judge what's being presented. So therefore, we'll you know, put them in uh, Never Never Land. So it's uh, interesting that you are sensitive to that as well. Um, and we certainly are here. In fact, that almost reaches down to the the community organizations and the elementary schools and things like that, that where you have first contact with people. So one of the thought was, thoughts we've got here is projects and programs with the schools that bring in the school kids, bring in the emergency response people in town, bring in the parents and, and take some uh, important but not emergency situation like uh, invasive uh, uh, albizia trees around here and understand how drones could help understand that situation and, and prepare for uh, disasters and such in this regard, really kind of get the word out in some way. But uh, we've even had requests for, from the, or even from our police department here, for 
how do we think of organizing a citizens corps that really wants to use their drones you know they want to do it in the right way they want to support a fire situation or a rescue situation or whatever they realize there's a yellow caution line they can't get across so how do we organize them at some level of training some level of accountability the way you worded it some level of responsibility let them produce information useful to the situation but keep them out of where the area where the area where, where danger might occur H has that sort of thing crossed your bow in terms of a citizens core of some kind and I think it's I think it's a good idea and it's just a matter of having enough communities that are willing to do something like that and then educating those citizen corps about what the the rules are I mean when you talk about law enforcement you know, when the FAA basically said, you know, they're they not going to be able to enforce operations across the country. So they wanted to educate law enforcement of what to do, what to do if you see someone flying a drone in a park. And, you know, it's just, it's pages of documentation on a website and, and not every law enforcement officer is going to go and, and really absorb that information. And so, you know, there's got to be a better way of doing it. And I think demonstrations, hands-on, you know, flying drones, understanding what these aircraft can and can't do are really important, but how do you do that across this entire country to reach those millions of people that are buying these products and flying them all the time? I mean, it's, it's really a, it's, it's a tough challenge, and, you know, it's, it's shows like these that I think can help educate, but we need to have a lot more of this. I mean, we joke around because we're a fairly new industry and, and not very rich in money, but if we had the money, it would be great to do a Super Bowl ad, you know, in conjunction with Lady Gaga flying with drones to, to kind of, instead of showing it as, entertainment and toys that you know we need a Super Bowl ad we need something comparable to that that reaches a tremendous amount of people and it's just we're just not there yet uh, agree on that you know uh, there's there's another side to this accountability issue that we that we're just talking about here the education component leading to accountability <clears throat> there's also on the manufacturing side something very interesting to me personally and that's the, what you might call the safety and response uh, and reliability and uh, 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 reliable life cycle cost aspects of, of a, a drone. If you're in the fire department and you will buy a new set of Motorola radios, you pretty much know what their reliability is going to be and how long they're going to last and what the warranty service is on them. If you go buy a drone, I'll bet none of that is evident to you. You don't know how long it's going to last. You don't know how many you have to buy because you may lose one. If you start depending on it, and then you have to have backup. So there's this whole concept of the life cycle utility of this technology that we, I think, need to have the users stand up and, and demand and push that over to the manufacturing side. I mean, I was just reading something on uh, Google last night about some guy who, from one of the really highly placed educated business journals that was going to examine and evaluate and report back on his new $2,000 drone he brought out here to Hawaii, and he said, but I can't because it's stuck up in the mountains, I can't get it. So anyway. Uh, the, these are single string dependent systems we have in general and if the GPS goes down or many other kinds of malfunctions that can occur, we lose them. So if you're a public safety guy, you're depending on this thing to return useful information in a dynamic situation, it's got to be there. Have, has the industry, and you see the industry more than we do, I would love to figure out how to talk to the industry. I don't know how to, but if you, have they address that kind of an issue of a life cycle reliability as part of the accountability equation? Yeah, I mean, I think the closest thing, there's a program that was kind of founded, I guess, by NASA. It was invented by NASA, and it's called New Star, which stands, I don't even remember what it stands for, but it's basically an underwriter's lab for drones. Uh, there's, there's a facility being stood up right now in New York, um, upstate New York, where basically the drones are going to be tested um, based on their manufacturing specifications. So they'll go through wind tunnels, their, their technology of, of return to home and sense and avoid and, and all of these different technologies and the, the vehicle platform itself will be, will be tested, the endurance will be tested. So if a, if a manufacturer's specs say that it can fly 15 minutes in whatever knots of wind, it'll be tested. And so then on the back end, there should be more reliability to the consumers that, or the, the end users that are buying these drones to have some sort of comfort that these drones have, have been tested and they've gone through some sort of standards. And, and so this is it's new, um, still under development, but I think it, it will hopefully address a lot of that. That's great. Uh, I'd like to know more about that. So, so you get like an Energy Star compliant stamp on your drone when you go buy it. You get some confidence it's going to be there. But you mentioned the word standards, another important word right alongside accountability. 
standards are something that ANSI is starting to push on, ASTM is, uh, uh, the, uh, not, the CDA is doing one thing, but the other group is the, uh, the one out of the Department of Commerce under RTCA that's looking at standards and radio communication and software and such. From your perspective, how do you see all those standards activities moving along, coming together, sharing information, resulting in one pile of standards, not four different piles of standards? Yeah, and I think that's another tough tough thing that we're seeing right now. I think ANSI public published a list of maybe 20 or 30 different groups that are looking at standards for our community. And so, you know, the, there needs to be kind of an ombudsman that pulls all of this together because I, I know that industry is starting to form its own collective groups to look at standards for different types of use cases. And so you've got the formal standards groups, then you've got industry that's trying to work together to create kind of, kind of some community-based standards. And so how does this all mix together? How does it feed through the Drone Advisory Committee if it does at all? And I just, I think there's so much, there, everything's kind of scattered right now. And so how do we bring that together? And that's something that Commercial Drone Alliance has considered is to be kind of a glue that maybe can bring together all these discussions. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a big task to do. So we got a lot of big tasks here. It's, a, it's a, a big business, lots of little fragmentation going on, and you've been in it for 13 years and seeing incredible change over those 13. And what do you think the next 13 is going to hold? I think we're going to see, you know, even more advancements. We're going to get to autonomy. We're going to get to be able to fly beyond visual line of sight. We're going to see package delivery. We're also going to see a lot of counter drone technology. We're going to see, you know, more requirements on the drone for remote identification. You know, we're going to see security concerns being addressed in a more meaningful way. I think we're going to see flying taxis. So we're not just going to see these small drones. We're going to see larger drones that are carrying people. Uh, we're going to see an air traffic management system that can manage all of this. I think, you know, we're just still really at the beginning of this technology, which has been around for, you know, 40 or 50 years. And, you know, it's just, we're just going to see some rapid advances and it's an exciting time. I mean, we're just, we're still really at the front end of a lot of the development of the technology. I agree it's an exciting time. I've only been in this for maybe five years, not anywhere near the length you've been in it, but uh, every day brings something new and some new revelation, some new idea that somebody's got. And then, David Place publishes it, and Robin Alexander publishes it. We all get to know about it. And then we get to have you on TV and get them on TV and, and uh, talk about the ideas in a ways that can be passed around. So once again, Gretchen, thanks very much for coming on the show today and uh, last year as you did. Next year is going to have to be in person here. And uh, uh, best of luck to the CDA. Of course, we're attempting to be part of that at UH. And uh, we love your... Uh, projections for the next 13 years, and we'll have to hold you accountable once a year for those next 13 to make sure they all come true. I hope so. Well, thank you for having me, and aloha. Okay, aloha. Thanks for being on the show.